The Rule 5 protection deadline has come and gone. We're going to talk about what that means for the Tigers, who they added to the 40-man roster. We made a small signing, so we're going to talk about familiar face, actually. We're going to talk about him. Award season in baseball, qualifying offers being mostly rejected. We're going to talk about that all today on Locked on Tigers. You are Locked on Tigers, your daily Detroit Tigers podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Locked On Tigers. I'm, of course, your host, Scott Bentley. Today is Wednesday, November 15th, 2023. Thank you so much for making Locked On Tigers your first listen every single day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Jace Medical. Empower yourself when you purchase a Jace case, providing you with a personal supply of five antibiotics that treat 50-plus infections. Get yours today at jacemedical.com. That's J-A-S-E medical.com. All righty. Well, welcome back, everybody. Hope you're having a great start to your week so far, the halfway point. Happy Wednesday. Uh, so today we are going to talk about uh, the Tigers' Rule 5 deadline that has come and gone. Major League Baseball's Rule 5 deadline uh, that has come and gone, not just the Detroit Tigers, obviously. Um, maybe later in the week we'll talk about some of the bigger names that were either some big decisions by other clubs, maybe. Today we're just going to talk about the Tigers, but uh, maybe as the week goes along, if we have time, we'll talk a little bit about some some surprise candidates that maybe didn't make it through the deadline, et cetera, because there certainly is bound to be some. I'm recording this immediately after the Tigers' announcement of who they are going to protect from the Rule 5. Uh, it's only a list of two players. I think I predicted three at the end. So uh, this year I, I predicted too many. Last year I predicted not enough. So uh, so there you go. I think last year I only had two, maybe three. It's either two or three names. They ended up protecting five players last year. This year, no surprises, no big, you know, Brendan White caliber shocker that everybody, you know, was super surprised about and didn't see coming. Just straight up, the most two just painfully obvious answers is who the Tigers are going to protect. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the two the Tigers removed from the 40-man roster as well, because that's obviously very important. Um, you know, there, there's an interesting-ish conversation there. So we'll talk about that. We're going to talk about qualifying offers because the decisions on all of those amongst Major League Baseball have been decided. There are only seven QOs handed out this year. Uh, so we'll talk about the ramifications of that. Uh, we'll talk about awards for a little bit, just riff about the awards that have been given out so far. Still the big dogs left, MVP, Cy Young, et cetera. But, um, you know, manager of the year, rookie of the year, gold glove, some other stuff out there. So that's kind of cool. Uh, and then the Tigers signed Bly Madris, who, uh, if you remember, was actually signed by the Detroit Tigers last offseason on a minor league deal. And then Scott Harris traded to the Houston Astros for cash. We'll talk about that a little bit at the end. Let's start by talking about the Rule 5 protection deadline. So uh, basically, the Tigers had, we uh, obviously yesterday's show was uh, an entire breakdown of all the possible names they could potentially keep. And they ended up keeping two players, and that's Dylan Dingler and Wilmer Flores. Um, in terms of the the them two specifically, there's not too much else of a conversation here. Um, we again we we broke it down a lot yesterday. Uh, I, I I agree with both. I agree with the decision to keep both of these guys. When it comes to Dingler, uh, I I would appreciate the catcher depth. I'm very very happy that. They decided to do the painfully obvious, which was to protect him. And then when it came to Flores, again, maybe not as painfully as obvious, but like you had to do it. And when it comes to their outlook in 2024, you kept them because you thought that there was a chance that they were going to get taken in the Rule 5. So when it that would somewhat imply that they may be close to Major League ready, right? Um, so when talking about 2024 for both of them, Flores, if he does make the majors, I would almost, I'm almost certain it would be in a reliever role. Uh, I, I wouldn't bet the house on Wilmer Flores being like in the rotation. Now, if injuries happen, those are unpredictable. Injuries happen every year, all the time. And obviously, like, I don't think anybody would have thought that Reese Olsen would have been like in the rotation on June 1st, but like stuff happens. So there's always a chance for that. 
Um, but he's going to have to take a big step forward. This is a guy that had a, a 3.9 ERA in a full season of Double A ball this year. Need him to take a big step forward. I can almost promise you he's going to spend a majority of this season in Triple A. Needs to work on command and just refining his non-fastball pitches. When he he kind of rose to prominence as he was striking out everybody under the sun in 2022, it was because he was able to just throw the fastball up in the zone and nobody could touch it. Right, which is a great skill to have. But it is also kind of, I, I'm, I got to figure out my wording here. It, it's I, I don't want to say it's bad for development. That that's not the what what the point I'm trying to get across. But it, it does cause a safety valve. It's like a bad habit, right? Like it, it causes a safety valve where like oh like if stuff goes wrong, if I'm down two own account, I'm just gonna throw three fastballs up in the zone and nobody can hit it. And that doesn't really te- – like eventually when you get to the AAA and to the majors, people are going to adjust and they're going to tee off on those. So um, he he just needs to refine the secondary stuff so he can get to a point where he is pitching consistently and, and not really relying on a fastball that is not a blow-by-you fastball at the major league level, even though it might be you know in the lower levels of the minors. So I'm very, very excited about the future of Wilmer Flores. He has really good stuff. He's an electric pitcher. And uh, I expect him to be in Toledo a lot this year. I guess there's maybe like a September call-up thing 2024. Again, barring injuries, obviously, that doesn't really count for predictions. Um, and so, yeah, I'm I'm fully expecting just a, a really solid developmental season from Wilmer. I want to see the strikeout numbers go back up. That, that was really the, the big thing that dipped, the kind of the disappointing thing. Obviously, you'd like the ERA to be lower, but I, I just really want the strikeout numbers to go back to where they were when he was kind of dominant. Um, and, and even if it's not as high as whatever, like 11 and a half or whatever it was at one point, um, even if it's not that high, you know, just getting it back over that like 10 mark, I I think would be a huge step in the right direction. So he's got some stuff to refine, but still all that being said, a no brainer to, uh, to protect at this deadline. Dingler, we already talked about a little bit. We obviously went more in depth a little bit yesterday. Um, but when it comes to him and, uh, his outlook in 2024, I really do think that he's going to get playing time in Detroit in 2024. Do I think that it's going to be the first couple of months of the season? No, I I don't think that they are penciling him in as like, oh, he's going to be whatever, backup catcher in May. Uh, Now, the thing that he, I guess I'll weirdly say, say he has going for him, but I'm not really sure that's the appropriate terminology there. But because it's so, the, the position he plays is so thin, If the Tigers were in a situation where either Kelly or Rogers got hurt, it's Dingler, right? It's not going to be Donnie Sands. Uh, I I would not be surprised if Donnie Sands didn't even make it through the winter. Uh, I I said that earlier in the week. Um, It just just hasn't really been all that productive in Toledo and is pushing 30 and and is still like a career minor leaguer. So it it wouldn't surprise me by any stretch if, uh, if either of those guys get hurt and the only option, really, is then Dylan Dingler in 2024. So that's something to keep an eye on. That's why I, I'm very confident he will get playing time in, in 2024 for the Tigers. But even barring injury, right? Eve, let's say Kelly uh, like hits well uh, and Rogers stays fully healthy. and Well, I guess both of them stay healthy and both of them hit well. Even if that is the case... I still feel like he is a guy that you are going to work in at some point if, obviously, he is hitting decently well. And that is the biggest thing. You know, he's had hot streaks and cold streaks. That's kind of been the epitome of his professional career so far. He's had uh, quite a few, like, couple of months stretches where you're like, okay, this dude's the real deal. And then some instances when not. And usually, like earlier on, it was just kind of like a long season thing in my eyes. Like catcher's a bruly, brueling position and, uh, and you know, just playing that that many games for the first time in your life. I, that was kind of the adjustment I thought was happening early on. And then last year, he kind of hit better in the second half of the season. And I was like, okay, that's a good sign to me for development. So uh, I expect him to get some playing time. We'll see how much injuries play a big part in that uh, to the people ahead of him. For Dylan Dingler, Wilmer Flores, I think probably not going to be prioritized, but if your pitching gets thin enough and he is pitching well, obviously most importantly, there's a chance for him to get back to the or to get to the majors in the first place, I guess, as well. All right. Okay, cool. Let's talk about 
uh, Freddie Pacheco and the players who were removed from the 40-man roster. We will do that right after I tell y'all about our friends over at Jace Medical. I just learned that through Jace Medical, you can get a one-year supply of ED medications. This means you don't have to wait or worry about whether or not you can refill your generics for Cialis, Viagra, et cetera, or all of those prescriptions. And this is possible because of our friends at Jace Medical. Go online right now at jacemedical.com to receive your 12-month supply on your daily medication. Remember to use promo code LOCKEDON at checkout for, dis- for a discount as well. A verified customer had this to say about Jace Medical, quote, I am thankful for this service. Supply chain issues caused me to cut pills in half to have it. I ordered most of my daily meds with a year supply. I also ordered an antibiotic kit. I feel secure now. Prices are lower than local pharmacies, and I highly recommend it for everyone. If you or someone you love need, would like peace of mind by having a year supply of daily medication, go to jacemedical.com to see if it's offered for you. R- remember to use promo code Locked On. For $20 off of your... Welcome back, everybody. Segment two here, Locked On Tigers. Appreciate y'all for tuning in, making us your first listen every day. Shout out to the everydayers that do tune in. Every day, we will be back tomorrow. Uh, Tomorrow, we start our conversations in regards to who is going to get protected from the 40-man roster, or not protected, that was this deadline. We're going to talk about uh, the the non-tender deadline, rather. Uh, Who is going to get non-tendered Potentially that big conversation will happen. That'll be Friday's episode, obviously, as that is the deadline, the 17th. But uh, we'll kind of open the doors for that conversation tomorrow. So uh, let's talk about the players who were removed from the 40-man roster to make room for Dylan Dingler and Wilmer Flores. Uh, That would be Freddie Pacheco and then Brennan Hanafi. Hanafi was one of the guys we kind of highlighted as like fairly obvious candidate here to... uh, to get removed from the 40 um, just didn't have too much major league experience this year. Wasn't really a standout when he was uh, if they really, really like him and want to bring him back, they can just get him to a minor league deal. We'll see what happens with him, but uh fairly obvious candidate there. Freddie Pacheco was not somebody that was really on my radar as somebody that could have been removed from the 40 yesterday. Um, and the reason why for me, I, I think this is pretty injury based uh it doesn't sound like pacheco is going to pitch for like until the end of this season at best so uh this could be a move where even if the tigers really like freddie pacheco uh which they seem to they have wanted this dude to pitch for like over a year now and uh just he he's been hurt and uh got hurt what in february of this year was was obviously the big injury so I, I think that it could, ju- and he had Tommy John, obviously, in the middle of the season. So you're talking about, like, probably going to miss all of this year, maybe comes back at the very end. Um, and so I think there's a chance that they're removing him from the 40 right now. And this has been thrown out by a few different people already, um, that he could be brought back on a minor league deal so he can rehab and and whatnot. And then the Tigers maybe will take a more serious look at him in 2025. Uh, so that is kind of the general vibe that I get from that situation as well. Uh, it just seems odd to prioritize him in the first trimming of the 40 and then like cut ways, t- cut ties now. I-, I do think that it's it's probably injury based. So uh, wishing him a speedy recovery, obviously. And uh, yeah, like he was he was electric. Like his stuff was really, really good pre-injury. Uh, kind of disappointed that that this I'm, you know, not all about me. I'm sure he's very disappointed as well. Pacheco, that is. Um, but uh, th- just very disappointed that we haven't got to see him really on a mound yet in the Tigers organization, just because uh, there was some pretty decently high hopes for him. I, I think some people even talked about like he might even have a path to the majors in 2023 before the injury. So um, we'll see what happens with his future. But that is the initial reaction I get. Really, the only surprise as far as people that weren't protected was. Magno, and we talked about that yesterday. You know, um, it, it's not the most surprising thing in the world. That was kind of a 50 50 ball to me. I think I put it at just over 50%. So I'm not absolutely stunned that he wasn't protected. I think the only reason that it really trips me up that he wasn't was pretty much solely because of the lefty thing. Right with the Tigers, especially after losing Tyler Alexander, just don't have very many left handed pitchers on their 40 man roster. And so I thought that this was like a really easy path 
to just bolster the left-handed depth in your bullpen uh, without having to like spend money or bring in somebody else or anything like that. And uh, he had good swing and miss stuff, swing and miss stuff in the minors, good swing and miss numbers, good strikeout numbers. Um, but he does walk a lot of people. His walk per nine and, and walk rate has been very high as a professional. So uh, I guess kind of the, the give and take of his style, but um, yeah, just somewhat of a surprise, but uh, again, if at the end of the day, the biggest contributor, we talked about this a lot yesterday, obviously, to these decisions is not really how the organization feels about the player. It's do is there a chance that this dude is going to get taken by someone else? Not only time will tell, we'll see in December if if a guy like Magno gets taken, but if they don't think that he's a huge risk to get taken by another team, then there you go. That that then he'll stay in the organization and uh, he just won't be on the 40 man roster and uh, it'll be, you know, minor league contracts for him for a couple of years. So we'll see what happens. But that was really the only big surprise. The other ones we talked about a lot, uh, you know, like Roberto Campos, there was some clamors for him. Like no one, no one is going to put Roberto Campos on a major league roster in 2024. And if they are, it's not going to last the entire year. He will be back in the organization because he's not going to hit very well. So like th there's guys like that, that, uh, and that's again, not me bashing. We talked about this way more in depth yesterday. That's not me bashing the ceiling of Campos or, you know, trying to like, uh, like, like spill somebody's Cheerios that, that the Campos uh, fan base, right. There's plenty of people that still believe in the kid um, and, and his ceiling. But right now, he had 214 and I single A. No, no team's going to draft him in the Rule 5 draft. So um, that is pretty much all I got for that. There you go. Rule 5 stuff is over with. Uh, we have our players protected. Congratulations to Dingler and Flores as well. It's a major accomplishment to get added to the 40-man roster. We, we've interviewed a couple of players. Brendan White, we talked about what the reaction was with him. Cody Clemens two years ago, we had him on the show and talked about, you know, what it meant to be added to the 40-man. That's a huge step in your path to the majors. So uh, congratulations to those gentlemen, wishing them the best and potentially seeing both of them in Detroit in 2024. Qualifying offers. Uh, the deadline for that is not yet here at the time of this recording. It might be by the time you're listening to this, um, but there's still time left and it doesn't even matter. All seven people that got offered qualifying offers uh, for the Detroit Tigers, or not for the Detroit Tigers, zero of them were Tigers in Major League Baseball, rather, uh, all declined. Uh, those seven players were, oh my gosh, it just went away. Okay, there we go. Cody Bellinger from the Chicago Cubs, Matt Chapman from the Blue Jays, Sonny Gray from the Twins, Josh Hader for the Padres, Aaron Nola for the Phillies, Shohei Otani for the Angels, and Blake Snell, obviously, for the Padres. So um, no surprises here whatsoever. I don't think anybody expected any of these guys to accept the only one, and I genuinely mean the only one that even had a glimmer of hope of accepting was Josh Hader. And that's just because relievers are, are weird in terms of like their market value. So that one, you might've been able to convince me that like he'd take $20 million for a year as a closer, a one inning pitcher. Uh, but even that, like, you know, I was like 90% sure that he was going to say no, the rest were just a hundred. So a little bit different, but still very confident. Um, and, and yeah, you know, the, the uh, th this has somewhat of an effect on the Detroit Tigers, really just uh, the entire free agent market. So now if you are to sign one of these seven guys, you lose a draft pick. Now, it can't be a very high draft pick. And I know first round draft picks are completely off the table. There's some other formulas and stuff that goes into um, that goes into determining which pick it is. Um, but that is the only thing that would like kind of brush people away. But even at that, like, are you going to prioritize like a sixth round pick over signing Aaron Nola? No, like <laughs> no team. No, there's 30 teams in baseball that laugh at that, you know, premise. So uh, not really a roadblock, but like something to keep in mind. If you are interested in one of these seven guys, you are going to lose one pick of some status. Um, you know, like, it's just so funny. Like, oh, even if it's a second rounder. Oh, are you going to be mad that you're losing a second round pick to sign Shohei Otani? Like, no, you're not. Um, and yeah, and then all seven of these teams, the Padres get two, which is fascinating. Uh, if these players are to sign with other people, other teams rather, uh, then they get a compensatory draft pick in between rounds one and two. So uh, there is your quick qualifying offer breakdown. 
and the ramifications of it. Let's talk about awards for a little bit. Then we'll talk about Blime Address and let you on with your Wednesday. All right. We'll do that right after I tell you all about our friends over at FanDuel. FanDuel is the absolute best. We talk about them all the time. And, you know, this NFL season, you can really score early and often with America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and so much more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season. All right, welcome back, everybody. Third and final segment here, Locked on Tigers. I appreciate you all for tuning in, as always. So I'm uh, going to talk about awards for a little bit. There's been, uh, obviously, like I said, the big boys still got to go MVP and whatnot. Uh, Cy Young MVP still have to go. But uh, we've got a good amount of awards here, some gold gloves given out, etc. And, you know, I... Obviously, no Tigers winning. Remember when Tigers used to win those awards, though? That was fun. Um, man, that that run from 2011 to 2013. Cy Young. Cy Young. MVP, MVP, MVP. That's crazy. That team didn't win a ring. Oh, my goodness. Okay, it's fine. We're moving on. Um so, manager of the year. Uh, you know, manager of the year, th- this has been my take on manager of the year since I was 12 years old. I can remember the first time I had this conversation, I was sitting in a middle school cafeteria. Um, and I, I don't think that it's it's changed, really, in, uh, in my entire time. <laughs> uh, be, I don't know, since middle school, I guess. Um, but manager of the year at this point, is essentially most improved team award or maybe even if it's not like most improved team it's more most uh exceeded expectations team that's essentially what manager of the year is at this point this year brandon hyde of the orioles and skip schumacher of the marlins were the winners of the award uh fits the bill i would say of that right and I, and I, it's kind of I don't want to say disappointing that it's so easy to just like know who's going to win manager of the year. Now you just look at preseason predictions or last year's record and you can pretty much figure out who's going to win it every year. Um, I thought there was a chance that like Bruce was going to take it home, uh, but technically like postseason's not supposed to matter in that, but still like the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Rangers weren't expected to do very well. So I thought there was maybe a chance for that, but I don't disagree with either of these either. Like, I'm not trying to sound like a hater where I'm just like, Oh, like these guys just got an award because the team played well. Like I, I don't disagree with that. I, I certainly agree with Brandon Hyde. Uh, I, I thought that he, he managed the Orioles very well. Obviously postseason they, uh, they went cold there, got eliminated. But uh, I mean, anytime you, you take a team that was projected to finish fifth in its own division and win a hundred games, you probably deserve some credit. So hats off to these fine gentlemen. The Marlins, oh, the Marlins. I, I, I don't want to get into their offseason because it's just been an absolute bleep show um, already. We haven't even like gotten to a lot of it. Uh, but I, I, at least they have this, I guess. I, I'm just, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm very fascinated with what the Marlins are going to do next year. That's like a big that's like a big fascination of mine is what on earth are the Marlins going to do this off season and how good could they possibly be next year? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I, I already was surprised that they did as well as they did this year. And I thought Kim Ng was doing well, uh, but I think everyone agreed that she was doing well, but apparently she had a conversation with the ownership and the higher ups and the powers that be within that organization and uh, they disagreed about the future direction, whatever that means. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I just, I, I'm very, very confused about their direction. But they have the manager of the year, lead the ship, baby. So we'll see what happens. Um, then, in terms of rookie of the year, uh, Corbin Carroll wins National League Rookie of the Year. Gunnar Henderson wins American League Rookie of the Year. I can't recall a time. And I'm sure there have been times, but I, I can't, off the top of my head, I can't recall a time 
in which both rookie of the years were so predetermined and slam dunk. There was no, there was no question about either of these, right? Like it, it was the most anticlimactic thing of all time. Everyone knew Carroll was winning NL. Everyone knew Gunner was winning AL. That there, there was no debate really to even be had. Like even when Otani won rookie of the year, it, there was like, oh, but what about Miguel Andujar, right? Like there, there's always been pushback. Um, and it, it's just a testament to how good these guys were. It wasn't a terrible rookie class for either league, but it's just a testament to how good those guys were. So, um, and the important thing to bring up, the reason why I, I wanted to kind of have this conversation was um, because Gunner made the, I believe, made the opening day roster. Now the Orioles get a extra first round pick. Uh, that is the new way that uh, in the collective bargaining agreement, that they are trying to incentivize calling people up uh, earlier and not doing service manipulation. So I don't think it's going to stop all of it. Uh, any, anybody who's like fringe, I think is still going to get the service manipulation treatment, but it is something like an extra first round pick. The Orioles have two first rounders now it's at the end, but like they have two firsts because they called up Gunner on opening day and he won rookie of the year. So uh, something to keep in mind as Colt Keith is probably going to be on the opening day roster for the Detroit Tigers in 2024, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Uh, so something to keep an eye on there uh, as we talk about, you know, prospects in the organization that uh, that may be playing for the Tigers next year. Uh, last thing I want to talk about, then we'll get you out of here. Bly Madris signs a minor league deal with an invite to spring training for the Detroit Tigers. Uh, if this sounds familiar, uh, you're not having deja vu. This happened around this time last year as well. Bly Madris was signed to a minor league deal for the, uh, to, for obviously for the Tigers. He was like weirdly one of Scott Harris's earlier on moves. Uh, and now the utility player, he plays like corner infield, corner outfield, is back. He is 27 years old. He turns 28 in February and yeah, he's it's so up to this point in his career, he's a career minor leaguer. Uh, he has a 500 OPS and a 173 average at the major league level in 51 games of major league baseball so far up to this point. Uh, and in the minors this past year for the Astros, he had a 761 OPS, not a lot of power, uh, but he walks a lot. I don't think that, th that Scott Harris just keeps signing this guy just to trade him for cash every year. Um, but I do think that he views him as we talk about organizational depth all the time. If Bly Madris is your starting left fielder next year, something has gone horrifically wrong. You have burned through like five outfield injuries. Something is terribly wrong, et cetera, et cetera. But the premise of having guys that fit your system, that fit your the way that you want to, to approach at bats, and, and and yeah, I guess fits your system is really the best way to word it. Um, organizationally, top to bottom, even the guys that that don't have any chance of making the majors, which I would very close to classify Bly Madras as, even those guys having the same makeup and same approach to at bats that you want to permeate throughout the entire system, is important. Um, so no, like I, obviously this, this is not, he's not even on the 40 man roster. Uh, I, again, if he plays major league baseball for the Tigers next year, something has gone terribly wrong. Um, but uh, I can at least understand the premise of bringing in guys that fit your prototype, even if it is the organizational depth guys. All right, cool. Anything else? I think that's it. Thanks for making Locked On Tigers your first listen every single day. Shout out to the everydayers that do tune in every day. We'll be back tomorrow. We're going to have a little bit of an off-season conversation. We'll kind of open the door on the on the non-tender conversation. But honestly, Friday's episode will mostly be like the big, you know, who's going to get non-tendered, who's going to get tendered, et cetera, combo. Um, so, yeah, we'll be back tomorrow, baby. Peace and love. Going to Therapy's Dope. I'll catch you all then. Go Tigers. Oh, I can't find my video. Go Tigers.